Hello and welcome to the Healthcare and Complicated YouTube channel. Before I go ahead, make sure you subscribe to the channel and also check all the previous content there. Also acknowledge our channel partners, all listed in the body of the YouTube description. Today, I have, I'm going to go straight to the guest. So I have Chuck Hazard. He's an entrepreneur and a wearables expert. Chuck, how are you? Good, good. And yourself? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for being in here. Yes, no problem. <laughs> um, I've been following your great work. There are not many people like us, wearables experts, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and today we are here to discuss the topic, challenges in wearable technology. Chuck, can I just ask you, from your point of view, what are the main challenges out there? Well, I think the, the biggest challenge is there's no standards organization with consumer wearables. So, that, you know, you don't know uh, if they've been validated against anything. Uh, and some of the validations are self-funded. So that is kind of a risk. Um, so I think that's the thing. There's no standards. And I, there were groups trying to have standards to make sure that, you know, every metric you pull off a wearable people knew what they were looking at, right? Because there was a standard associated with it, even heart rate, for instance. Yeah, brilliant. That's a fantastic, a fantastic point. One thing is about the accreditation, but then the standardization. Uh, you know, we can actually, we can cover so many things. I think we needed probably three or four or five interviews to cover all the main aspects. It's so right. much. But that leads me to pass the ball back to you around the accuracy or lack of thereof what are your insights on that well i i think some things are have gotten better and other things have not like for instance the uh the optical light sensors used in most wearables today to track heart rate have gotten much much better i mean apple watch for instance you know since the apple watch 4 um for most people unless they have some circulation issues matches a chest strap for accuracy during even workouts, which is phenomenal. Garmin also has gotten much, much better in recent years. So even when you're active, the heart rate is much more, much better. Um, likewise, another metric that people are looking more at is heart rate variability, which is uh, your heart doesn't beat like a metrodome. It varies like by milliseconds between each beat. And the more variation is, it means you're more parasympathetic. So you're in rest relaxation not fear and flight uh if it's not variable variable um and so when people are sleeping a lot of the devices um have gotten much more accurate for tracking that metric uh now where they fall down uh every wearable is uh, sleep staging is an example uh, none of them are very accurate if you go in for a sleep study um pulse ox uh, even with the apple watch withings uh, whoop aura is god awful um temperature sensing uh, off the off the wrist uh even for skin temperature i don't think anybody is calibrating their sensor so that maybe it's good for trending maybe not who knows um but the list goes on and on so it's uh, step counting is another one that seems to be very flawed for a lot of people right absolutely thank you for highlighting these um, uh, very important aspects that leads me to kind of link to the consumer wearables what are your views on consumer wearables being used in health studies well i mean there are the studies that uh, consumer wearables are being used in um haven't i'm guessing the irbs uh haven't dictated they need an fda approved device and so uh you know, they're trying, they, they probably have an interest in, you know, one or more metrics that a certain wearable is collecting and maybe they feel it's good enough for their, their purposes. Um, and I know some far, pharmaceutical companies, for instance, may just be looking for step count or general seat metrics. And so a consumer wearable works fine for that. They don't even need FDA approval because that's not what they're interested in uh, for the outcome. But uh, there's still a lot of studies do dictate an FDA approved device, which takes all the consumer wearables out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. 
Um, Chuck, what are your views around filling the gaps between healthcare visits? You know, wearables are an excellent vehicle to gather information, the health data, and a lot of um, metrics. And now we've seen recently a big push in digital health with remote monitoring capabilities and wearables fit in really nicely. How do you think we can leverage wearables in terms of filling the gaps in within the healthcare, between the healthcare visits? No, I think you're right there. I mean, even if a device, you know, for a given metric isn't like medical quality, the trending is important still. So you that does help you fill the gaps because depending if there's a chronic illness, they may not or not, they may not see their health team, you know, six months, every six months. So a lot can happen in between. So you can still look at like how much sleep they're getting, how consistent it is, what's their resting heart rate. You might look at heart rate variability, respiration rate, even pulse ox, you know, the trending could still be important. Uh, but one of the challenges still is the data collected by a consumer wearable, how do you get that to the healthcare team? because there's very little integration between the wearable companies and the you know, electronic management systems they're using in healthcare. The one exception, at least with the big hospital systems that use Epic, for instance, uh, Withings has actually integrated with Epic. And so a doctor that's in a hospital system or even a smaller clinic that does use Epic, and some of them do, um, they can actually order a Withings scale, blood pressure meter, um, sleep mat, and I think the temperature sensor. Anyway, they can order it directly from Epic. It gets de delivered to the patient. The patient, a lot of the stuff is cell backhaul, so they don't even have to do anything, no mobile involved. And the, the results from when they weigh themselves, everything goes back into the, the client patient record in Epic. You know, so there's no, it's very low friction, but that's an exception. I mean, Whoop, Aura, um, Garmin, none of them are integrated with any of these electronic systems. And so the doctor, you know, other than the patient um, sharing uh, screenshots shots of their their app, they, they can't get access to that data. Mm, brilliant. Th thank you for that uh, uh, insight, Chuck. I mean... I've done a lot of work around wearables, as you know, and um, I've done like a 159 pages report a while back on the consumer wearables, the health wearables engagement. And we come up with five, we done even face-to-face -face interviews, people wearing Fitbits and stuff. Um, and um, we come up with five um, barriers for the consumer and five device-related barriers. And guess what was the number one barrier, device-related barrier? interoperability and the exchange right. of data yeah what you mentioned is extremely extremely important even there are data integrators there is another dead dike because the discrepancy of the data and the security issues is so much attached to it i'm actually doing a keynote um uh, soon in us around wearables and wearables are excellent for eventually to leverage as an, an as a self-care tool but mm -hmm. you'll be self-care or will be a nightmare in healthcare. So sometimes right. we don't know where you are with it. So um, moving on, Chuck, uh, in, in, in your opinion, what's working and what's not working? And you cannot highlight any other challenge because there are so many aspects to cover up in here. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, in the, the bigger hospitals, uh, especially ones that have an, um, groups that are looking at consumer wearables in, in this problem, um, we're starting to see some of these hospital systems looking at, so like for instance, the Aura Ring recently was one of the bigger um, hospital systems that they want to use it for population health. And so they're willing to run, um, you know, sort of a platform in parallel with their electric, like the Epic, for instance. Um, and as long as it's, you know, meets their uh, security requirements for the hospital system, as far as hacking and all that stuff, um, they're willing to run it in parallel to get like aura data for these special projects, which is interesting. And I think we'll see more and more of that over time. But I think for at least in the interim, you're going to see, you know, like a, a separate third party platform, not part of their normal uh, back end systems. 
Mm, that's a brilliant. That's a brilliant point. Um, Chuck, is there anything else that you want to highlight, the challenge, or anything around wearables whatsoever before before our roundup? No, I think I, I think we covered the high points. I mean, I I think uh, we will see over time consumer wearables, you know, both be integrated into some of these systems at hospitals, um, but also to your point about self care, um, using with perhaps health coaches that are part of a hospital system, which they don't usually use, but they may start using them, that can get access to the data through whatever means and actually drive behavioral change. Um, you know, so patients can actually have better outcomes in the long term, because if they're just going in, you know, every six months, even if it's diabetes, if the doctor doesn't have access to like a weight scale and a CGM and things like that, they don't know what's going on in between. But a health coach, if they can see that data, they can help guide the patient into better outcomes. Great. Chuck, thank you so much. Well, I'm going to um, wind down now. I have one last item for us to address. And it's like a big question. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to... I, I ask all the all my guests this question is, how can we make healthcare uncomplicated? Uh, well, we have to lower um, the barriers of entry to healthcare. Um, you know, a lot of that comes to... Uh, a lot of the population doesn't have easy access to the hospital systems um, because they don't have transportation or the hospital is way far away. And so that's where I think consumer wearables can come in is being able to treat the patient and meet them where they are uh, physically and intellectually and technologically. So I th and it's got to be low friction. That's brilliant. That's a really nice way to round up. Um, Chuck, thank you so much for accepting my invite and, and well done on the brilliant work. You are very active in the space. I follow your LinkedIn, your amazing insights as well. All right. No problem. I enjoy what I do. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. I'm going to round up now to all our viewers and listeners. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also, I'm going to post uh, Chuck's details in here, his LinkedIn and his Twitter. He's very active in the space. Ask him questions around wearables, engage with him. He's very, very knowledgeable. And also, uh, make sure you uh, connect with the channel, check all the previous content, acknowledge our partners, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.